and welcome to the BNL Eclipse Hour. My name is Aaron Harrell and I'm the media teacher here at the North Lawrence Career Center. And I'm Dr. Aaron Miller and I'm the secondary curriculum director for North Lawrence Community Schools. Today we have another great podcast for you about the upcoming total solar eclipse. We have of course Mr. Joachim Ladwig, which is our Earth Space Science teacher, NASA partner, and Eclipse ambassador. We're also happy to have Mrs. Lacey Hawkins. Mrs. Hawkins is a distinguished teacher at Bedford North Lawrence High School in Bedford, Indiana, with 15 years of teaching experience. Her primary courses at BNL include World History, Dual Credit World History, and Dual Credit U.S. History. Mrs. Hawkins earned a bachelor's degree in history from Indiana University and a master's degree in history from American Military University, both with honors. During her graduate studies, she focused on ancient and classical history. Mrs. Hawkins believes that studying history is important because it gives us a sense of connectedness as a species. History explains how humans have gotten to where we are and who we are. Mrs. Hawkins has always been interested in space. As a child of the 80s, she grew up with NASA's space shuttle program and visited the Henry Crown Space Center, often with her parents. As an avid reader and local bookstore owner of Inklings Bookstore near the square on 16th Street, Mrs. Hawkins highly recommends reading astronaut Scott Kelly's book, Endurance, A Year in Space, A Lifetime of Discovery. Welcome, Mrs. Hawkins. Uh, hello, uh, Lacey Hawkins. Can I call you Lacey, Mrs. Hawkins? What do I That's do? That's fine. Either's fine. Okay. Um, your bio tells me that we have some common background and perspectives, but I did not know you were a bookstore owner. That's pretty cool. We are. So um, 12 years now. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Um, in your words, I've always been interested in space. Uh, are a perfect fit kind of for just launching into our conversation today because it turns out eclipses happen in space, right? Right. Um, it's, and I have to apologize. Though, although we work probably 50 yards apart around one corner. That's right. I think we've actually talked like in depth four times in, in four years, and I feel bad about that. But uh, nonetheless, uh, those have been great chats, and I look forward to this one because they've been. we have some good stuff to talk about. Uh, I'm excited to have you here with me, with all of our viewers uh, here in all of Southern Indiana, maybe. This could be a big deal. I'm excited about that. Uh, here during the BNL Eclipse Hour. So thanks a ton for risking being on TV. I'm glad to be asked. I'm glad to be here. So I'd, I'd like today to uh, chat a bit about eclipses and, and uh, bring some new thoughts about them into our uh, NLCS viewing audience. Of course, our students, uh, but the family members, young and old, right? We've got generations here that are have never experienced an eclipse before. Right. And that's super exciting. Yeah. yeah? Uh, specifically today, talking about eclipses in history, uh, the earliest references and connections, which I think you are well-versed in that stuff, um, and the cultural impact of eclipses. Uh, perhaps it's a lot more than we think. Uh, and last but not least, I guess the influence of uh, eclipses on human history and uh, maybe just a touch of eclipse viewing safety because, you know, moms would like us if we did that. Yeah. Uh, for the sponsors and the kids. Uh, so as a, shall we? Sure. All right, here we go. As a matter of orbital geometry, eclipses have been occurring since Earth's first moonrise, yeah? since before there were eyes to see them, which you've already kind of alluded yeah. to. Yeah. Um, do you have any insight on uh, the, the earliest recorded evidence, if you will, of eclipse events? Yeah, so when we get into that era of... Um, Prehistory. I mean, you said recorded, right? But yeah. we do have some evidence that maybe there's um, recorded eclipses that weren't written. Uh, mm. So, for example, we have um, petroglyphs are maybe our earliest um, references to eclipses. So in Ireland, there's a little bit of debate over this, but there are um, uh, petroglyphs are like drawings in rocks, right? We're like carvings, like taking a rock and scratching another rock. And those have um, persisted. Like they, they, we still have those and can look back at them. Um, but there are petroglyphs that date back to um, 3300 BC um, that show like circles overlapping. And, and so there's a lot of thought that like these circles that are overlapping are maybe someone saying like, whoa, right? Like yeah. they saw this happen and they, they weren't writing, right? This is a, a pictographic language. Right. Um, but that might be our earliest sources. Um, our earliest written sources probably date back to China um, in like around 2500 BC. Um, but the cool thing is, is it's like pretty much every civilization that like when a civilization appears, like we talk about the Egyptians, like as soon as we have a civilization, we have documentation that they were talking about eclipses. So, which is, is pretty cool. So wow. it shows that they must have been 
so shocking that every civilization wanted to write about them. Impactful. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so that stuff, uh, that stuff, sir, I don't mean to say that stuff. Um, Ireland. Yeah. Pictographs. I would have to say that's recorded, right? Yeah, and, I think so. Yeah. I mean, there's some debate about like what are these circles meaning, but the, just you know, based on the the context around them, that a lot of historians think this is some kind of effort to chart space. So, which every civilization that we have has been doing. So, just cool. Well, that's interesting, and that gets to a question down the road. Nice, cool. So, to consciously use an eclipse culturally, uh, the events would have to be predictable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, have you uncovered evidence uh, that goes to the ancients doing this prediction of early eclipses? Yeah, that, um, and I love this too. Like I said, you know, as long as we've had humans, they've been trying to figure out and and even not necessarily predict eclipses, but predict star movement, right? Mm. And so as soon as they started charting stars and then they could say like, oh, that star is going to be over there, um, then that leads them to like, what else can we predict, right? So an eclipse is like a star is there every night, right? So it's it's easier to kind of predict where it's like an eclipse happens and then it's like, when's that going to happen again? And right. so trying to do the... Um, the math and the research on that is really kind of cool, like to watch ancient scientists say, um, you know, why did that happen? And like there's a um, great story. I'm, one thing that I'm terrible with is dates, so I have tons of notes in front of me that have um, dates on things. But in uh, around 100 BC, there was a, a Greek scientist who saw an eclipse, and it was a, um, a total eclipse, mm. right? But he heard that there was a town that was like so many miles away, and they were saying that it covered like four fifths of the sun. And he was like, wait, like if it covered all the sun here and four fifths of the sun were there, like he did the math to figure out how far away the moon was from earth. And that's going to like put us in those kind of places where you can start saying like, well, if it's that distance and we're here, then like to figure out, yeah, like the, the being able to predict it. And that's like one Greek scientist, right? Like there were scientists doing this in China, like 400 years earlier. Um, and, and Middle Eastern scientists who were trying to predict because it was so important. Like they really were affected by eclipses. So they wanted to know when's that going to happen again? The ancient Greeks did the math. And, the, and as I talked to my astronomy students, the ancient Greeks did a lot of math yeah. in sandals with a stick in the sand. Yeah. Pretty incredible stuff. Yeah. And that's true of, you know, really all of this science. Like we think about astronomers today using just, you know, massive computers and mm -hmm. even things like the telescope. And these ancient scientists were using, like, their eyes, right? Like, their eyes and their brain. And that's how they were figuring out like, incredibly complex things. Yeah. So. I mean, all the geometry, I mean, yeah. to figure the the area of this, the surface area of the bottom of a cone on the Earth, yeah. which is already round, yeah. my goodness, and figuring it out to a small percentage of accuracy. Yeah. yeah? Or a small percentage of error. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. uh, astounding. That's yeah. really cool. I didn't realize that they had uh, been looking at the uh, the uh, the, the roll off of yeah. the eclipse at a distance. Yeah, that's that's so interesting to me because I I don't see myself as someone who's like particularly math minded, but I recognize the importance of math. I think because of history, where I'm like, wow, like that person understood math. Like they understood math in a way that I don't. My brain doesn't work that way, but like. I, my brain works in a way that I appreciate hmm. what they've done, like, and how important that was. And they're doing applying math. Yeah. And I know Definitely. conversations that we have in class sometimes struggle because it's hard to apply the math. Yeah. And it's just a bunch yeah. of numbers. Yeah, absolutely. And so why know that? Yeah. But like writing can... down those problems and figuring out, like, kind of basic geometry about, like, how cones work. Yeah. And then being able to use that to predict an eclipse is, that's very cool. I think, I think realizing the need yeah. to do that and then go, yeah. oh my gosh. Like I have the skills to do that because of this math. That's, right. And I, yeah. I cannot sell loudly enough uh, college astronomy. Yeah. Take astronomy 101, 102, those basic college classes. Yeah. Um, even if you're not a math guy or a math gal, a math person, go and try these tech classes out. It'll change your life. Yeah, It'll absolutely. change this idea right here. Yeah, I think so. I um, When I was in high school, the math requirements were a lot different than they are today, but... Um, that I, I was in a math class that I didn't need to graduate, mm -hmm. right? That I it was like an extra math class, I guess. Um, and I decided that like I was struggling in the class and I decided to drop it because it's like, I don't need it to graduate. And now I'm like, what a mistake. Like, I wish I had stayed in it because I think it would have made my brain work better. Like I would have been a better thinker if I just pushed myself through the class. So I'm a proponent of that. Even if I don't see myself as a math minded person, I wish I was more math minded. 
Well, I might have a class for you later. I'll give you the link. Okay, it's pretty <laughs> good. It's good. free. It's online. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great class. It's about applications. Yeah, it's awesome. I like it. Um, I'd like to bring it on as a high school class here at school. Um, moving on, though. Sure. Because otherwise, this would be a five-hour show. Right. Which would be great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've studied a bunch of these several geo, uh, geographically isolated cultures, right? Yeah. Uh, Rome, China, and Greece. And they are or not somewhat se separate. Is there evidence of any shared uh, knowledge between yeah. them? That's a great question because they were trading, right? Like we have mm -hmm. evidence that the, like trade goods were going from China to Rome. Um <sighs> If there's evidence of knowledge about space being transferred between them, I don't, I don't know it. That is definitely not an area that um, I have seen much evidence for. Um, you know, some of that, I, I wonder if, and I'm such a proponent of this, that knowledge is power, right? Like all throughout history we talk about, like the more you know, the better your situation is going to be, right? The better problem solver you are. And so I wonder if there were societies that were like, hey, we're going to make this thing and then we'll sell it to you and we'll make money. And I was like, but if we have knowledge, like giving it to you is not to our benefit, mm. right? So um, I wonder if I haven't seen those sources just because they don't exist. Like I think there is an idea that controlling knowledge is is to your benefit. So, so I don't know if they were sharing space knowledge. Mm. Like the Vikings would share knowledge about how to navigate the seas or not. Right, yeah. Because it was to their benefit to not right. share. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Early economics. Yeah. Viking economics. That's right. That's not a topic I've talked much about, but yes. Uh, and this is how our conversations go, by the way. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. They're great. Um, uh, moving on then into uh, uh, applications, cultural applications of Eclipse stuff. Sure. Um, we talked kind of about some uh, uh, raw history and evidence, right, of early Eclipse things. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any background uh, about specific cultural or or even or religious, which is a separate mm, part of sure. the culture, right? Applications of eclipse knowledge. Um, so, how civilizations understood eclipses, uh, and, and, and would apply them in there? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, the first, like the earliest sources about eclipses, mostly are fear, right? Like they're like, what happened to the sun? Right? It seems to be like yeah. overarching. Um, and like I said before, like one of the things I like about history is being able to say like, look at that civilization over there and these guys and these guys. And like all of them are responding to this event the same way. Right. And so we get, you know, some of our earliest sources out of China that talk about like the sun being eaten. Mm -hmm. And there's some like linguistic studies. I definitely do not speak Chinese, um, but some like linguist, some linguists who say that the, the Chinese word for eclipse is the same word for to eat. Right. And so it's like this idea that the sun has been eaten. Right. Um, and so they, we get this like some of the mythology, you know, the, the oracle bones that exist. Um, so before we have paper um, and so we're like writing on bones, asking questions of the gods, like when will the sun be eaten um, or when will in some cases like the dragon come and eat the sun? Because if sun's going to be eaten, like that's passive. Right. Like what's eating the sun? Um, and so they come up with mythology about like the sun being eaten by a dragon. And what's crazy about that is like other civilizations also refer to the sun being eaten, right? So like the Vikings have mythology about um, um, wolves that eat the sun, right? The Mayans talk about a giant snake eating the sun. The Inca talk about a, a jaguar eating the sun. Um, so which is, is really cool that they, that was just the understanding of, of ancient civilizations, right? To believe that something ate the sun. Um, generally speaking, when we look at um, eclipse history, it tends to be that civilizations respond to it as if it's bad, right? Like, we don't get very many, like, neat. Like, we get a whole lot of, like, this is bad. Um, and I think that's, I don't know, like, that's what makes me excited about seeing an eclipse is, if, you know, thousands and thousands of years of human history of people just being scared. Mm. And so I kind of want to see it and be like, oh, okay, like, I understand why that scared them. <laughs> I know why that was so confusing. Um, it's not, I think, 100% the case. You ask about, like, religious examples. Um, there's a story in um, the Hadith, which is like the, the traditional stories about Muhammad, that he experienced an eclipse. And um, that when he saw it, he, um, this is like from the Hadith, he said, the sun and the moon are, are two signs of God. So when you see them glorify and, and supplicate to God and observe prayers and give alms, and that he did like an extra long prayer, because um, in Islam, like prayer is pretty regimented, and he did yes. an extra long prayer watching this eclipse happen. And then it became a thing, like that, like his followers were like, when there's an eclipse, that's the prayer we're going to pray. 
And so they um, associate the eclipse as an opportunity to like spend more time devoted to their religion, um, like to thank God for the mysteries of space. So, which is is pretty cool too. That is neat, yeah. and it does, and it even just thinking about it, there's all that fear. Yeah. Right. So that's a way to take away the fear. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, you know, d depending on where you want to put things, but um, there's a story in the Babylonian civilization that they, and the Babylonian civilization, like the Babylonians were around for a long time. So we have sources that date hundreds of years of part that reference this idea that when the eclipse happens, that it was a bad omen, right? It was like, the king is going to get it, right? Like the gods are really mad and they're going to like cover the sun and then bad things will happen to the king. So it became a thing about like, can we predict when an eclipse is going to happen? Because they recognized that if the eclipse happened and something bad happened to their king, usually if you lose your king in the middle of his reign, that's bad and it's bad for your government. So they came up with this plan that if they could predict when the eclipse was going to happen, that they would, on the day of the, like a couple days before the eclipse, they would take the king and hide him and put a false king in and like they would make him like proclaim like I'm king and they'd be like, you're a king. And then when the eclipse happened, uh, they would kill him and be like, we're sorry, like whatever is bad, like we killed him, we took care of it. And then the eclipse would go away and then they would bring the real king out and be like, shoo, like you're good. Now you can keep ruling. No way. So they did this like replacement king for hundreds of years in, in the Babylonian civilization because they were so frightened that something bad was going to happen. So, and it's cool too, because it leads to like some cool stories about like that, because you have a fake king and a real king at the same time. And they would equate it with like the sun and the moon exist at the same time. So it was like for like four minutes, right? We're going to have the sun and the moon in the same place. Well, in Babylonian society for like five days, we're going to have a fake king and a real king. And then we get rid of the fake king and put the real king back in place. So wow. like, there's a lot of fear um, associated with the eclipse for sure. Usually bad omens. So. so I know a lot of kids are asking right now, how do I get that job? Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a funny story, too, about, like, the, the fake king when the eclipse happened um, right before the... It's like right before or right after, like, really close to, like, the time of the eclipse. The real king, uh, according to one of the sources, drank broth that was too hot and died. <laughs> like, I don't know what happened. like, wink, wink, died or really died? You know, it's unclear. It just says he drank broth that was too hot and died. Um, but he was the real king. And so the fake king was in place, and they were like, well... I guess you're just the real king now. And they left him in place. And he was like a gardener before, right? So they like picked this random gardener, put him in place, and were like, we're going to kill you after the eclipse. Oh, the real king's dead. Never mind. You can just be king. Um, so like the eclipse kind of put a random gardener in as king in the Babylonian empire in like one situation. So fear leads people to do strange things. Well, so. I'll make a note for a follow-up conversation. That's okay. pretty cool. I'm curious where that all went down the road. Right. Sure. Wow. Um, so uh, cultures and subcultures in the past have applied eclipse knowledge to benefit their people. It seems like that's that's kind of the trend. They're trying yeah. to make it better. Sure. Have there been any evidence of uh, more manipulative uses maybe? <sighs> so I was looking for, you know, in leading up to this podcast, stories about um, solar eclipses because mm -hmm. lunar eclipses are fairly different, right? It's like it's nighttime and the moon gets a little darker, Right, and right. It's, it's not as striking as it seems. And like, much more to, common. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And to lose the sun um, for such an amount of time, um, I did not, in trying to like rack my brain and look through sources, find much about the idea of like manipulating. Like, ooh, look, we can do the thing. Um, there's a story about Columbus that he did this with Native Americans with a, uh, a lunar eclipse. That on his journeys, he ended up in Jamaica and Native Americans, like, he, he was captive. And then he predicted, like, the moon's going to go dark and that's going to show that you should let me go. And that they were like, wow, he predicted that wow. and let him go. So, like, there's a little bit of um, evidence of kind of lording your knowledge of space over um, other people. So. And, and I think that's that's the word, that, that idea of uh, uh, controlling the knowledge, yeah. right? Ergo, having the power yeah. that you alluded to earlier. Yeah. Uh, which can be scary. Uh, it can. And maybe that's why I think that, you know, earlier conversation we had about social media is, I think it's so cool in that we're, we're, I think we're so much less like that today, right? That we're not like, ha ha ha, I have knowledge. Mm. But now we're like, I have knowledge, right? Like I'm a, I have knowledge right? and like share it out with the world. So it, that's, that's kind of cool. Like that we we're much more free in sharing our knowledge. 
So like we see it as like a cool thing to share rather than like a thing to be hoarded. And secretly in the back of my mind, I'm seeing pictures of cats. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Sure. Like I said, there's lots of ways to use social media. Yeah. And that's right. It's a powerful tool and yeah. it has powerful applications for both education, and entertainment yeah. and uh, all the other things that you can like, bring into the culture. Yeah. Uh, speaking of more culture, 1715 A.D., yeah. 1715 AD, uh, yeah. pre America, right? In the That's roots true. era yeah. of America. Yeah. Are we talking uh, Kepler? We uh, Edmund Haley. Oh, Haley. Or, yeah, I'm, sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, Edmund Halley. Yeah. And so I have, yeah, like sources that say Halley and Haley. So I was going to ask a scientist on this one. Um, yeah, with Newton, right? Yeah. So, the yeah. one and only Sir yeah. Isaac Newton, the yeah, guy. After, sure. They named the, the cookie after him, right? Uh, maybe. They named a comet after the other guy. So, yeah. Not. So you're in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the guy. Well, they, they mapped. Uh, I don't know if it's the first map, but I feel like it might have been the first map of an actual eclipse. Yeah, right. Um, cool. Umbra. Yeah. Right? And, and over London. Yeah. And then, then they predicted it at enough time, they made a big fuss about it, you know? Yeah. And I don't know how that shook out because I don't follow that part of the scene, but I've got a picture of it. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. Um, I don't either, other than knowing that those two guys kind of work together, like put their two great brains together to to come up with this really cool knowledge that, as far as I know, is the first diagram map. So that's the first? As far as I know, yes, for that extent of... Right. True things. true documentation to the yeah. to the degree that we would consider documentation yeah. today. Like there's a little bit of prediction about like, ooh, the eclipse will happen here at this time, but I don't know that anybody had said like, and here, and here. Before. And not there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the, the map is explicit. It's a yeah. perfect oval. It's all yeah. of the stuff that we're going to be seeing yeah. uh, with all the detail that we do now with our supercomputers, yeah. Yeah? which again, pretty amazing. Um, compasses, straight edges, amazing. Science. Yeah. Wow. The calculus guy. Uh, yeah. It's hard to know because we now see the world in a different way. Yeah. Um, and we're just disconnected from our sky. Yeah. I think that's. Yeah. But we don't have to be connected because we don't depend on it for our everyday thing anymore, right? Our everyday. Yeah, I would say so. I think sometimes um, I'm such a like, uh, defender of like kids these days. Um, but I, I think too that we're overwhelmed like as a society with just the amount of information and things to process, right? Like, and I think we get event fatigued, right? Where we're like, oh, there's a war over there. Oh, there's a war over here. Oh, this political thing is happening. Oh, this economic thing is happening. And they're like, oh, and there's something with the sun too? Like, okay. <laughs> like, it just becomes um, that I think people kind of get burned out on things, right? Because they're just like, that's another thing. That's another thing. And, you know, in the historical perspective, like an eclipse was not just another thing. Like it was a really big thing. Right. Uh, like it, it stopped. And you kind of alluded to that, right? Like the society kind of stops hmm. for those minutes when when that's happening. And that's not just like, oh, the news says this is happening. So, but but I think we have a tendency to put it in that category, right? To be like, oh, an eclipse too. Like, okay, whatever. Um, well, yeah, so. the lunar eclipse, uh, when a lunar eclipse happens, nothing, nothing. happens. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's not even noticed. A partial eclipse, mm -hmm. we stood outside in the rain on a day for the partial eclipse and people stopped and said, what are you guys doing out here? I said, oh, right. we're waiting for the clouds to break for this partial eclipse yeah. to come out. And they're like, okay. And they just right. drove away like we were crazy people. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was definitely interesting to look at the sources about how different a total eclipse was from a partial eclipse, too. Like, that partial eclipses were almost the same way in ancient history. People were like, oh, it's a kind of a thing. But, like, total eclipse, and it was like, you get the weirdest sources from this time period. Like, I was reading something about this guy who, like, watched, like, a total eclipse happened, and he was watching this crow uh, and he mm. documents that, like, this crow is, like, doesn't know what to do, and the crow starts flying backwards, and, and, like, that's really weird, right? Like, something weird is happening when nature starts responding differently, right? Mm. Um, there's a, a much, much older Greek source where people were like, oh, my gosh, like, the sun replaced the moon. Like, what is going to happen? And this, like, uh, Greek philosopher was writing about, like, well, probably dolphins are now going to live on land, and land animals are going to live in the sea, and, like, nothing is what we thought right it's like we day. yeah it's opposite day right like if the sun can replace the moon and the moon can replace the sun then i guess nothing is for real right like it messed with their understanding of facts right so. and those people 
brilliant as they were. They were educated people. Big time, yeah, absolutely. Uh, as philosophers. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. They didn't do a lot of experimenting. Yeah. Right? It was all... Yeah, observation. Observations right? and like, head games. Yeah. And so when you turn your whole world upside down, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, how different it is from somebody who says like, oh, four-fifths of the sun was covered over there and it was totally covered over here. Like, that must mean math to someone who's like... Well, nothing's real. <laughs> you know, so just throw up your hands about all understanding of anything. Except so. for Euclid. He was like, oh, I'm in. Yeah. This is my moment. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah indeed. Indeed. Uh, so, I don't know. Uh, I, I say so too much, probably. Uh, in recent Western history, I believe that uh, eclipses have been the catalyst for big doings, right? Big yeah. things have happened uh, because there were eclipses coming. Or, yeah. or they, uh, I don't know if they just happened and people did things because they happened or if they saw them coming. In recent times, um, in more, uh, more close to America, like since 1715. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I'm curious if you have any of those things on tap that, you, that you're familiar with, like how the vector has changed because of this eclipse. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so since my background's mostly in ancient and classical, like right. there's a lot, um, definitely know a lot of events that are tied to... Um, eclipses where it was like an eclipse happened and that caused this like major historical event. Um, you know, I think once we get past 1715, mm -hmm. um, we do have such a better understanding of like, okay, that that's not a bad omen, right? <laughs> like that's science. And um, so I think it in some ways does cause less of an effect. People don't respond to it as strangely as they did if they were like, the gods, right, are telling a thing, right? Now they're just like, oh, space, you know? So, um, you know, post-1715, um, one of the major standout events uh, in American history was the Nat Turner Rebellion. Um, that Nat Turner is uh, an enslaved man who is um, very passionate about the idea that God is going to rescue uh, slaves from slave owners. And in that ends up with, like, this religious vision that it's his job to... Uh, to lead this massive rebellion um, and says that um, that God speaks to him. And at some point in time, he said, uh, he said, I had a vision. I saw white and black spirits engaged in battle and the sun was darkened um, and that he had to wait for this to happen. Right. He had to wait for the sun to be darkened. And when the sun gets darkened, like that's his moment. Um, so he said, like, um, by these signs in heaven, it would be known to me when I should commence my work. Uh, and the, the time was fast approaching. So like somehow he had this knowledge that there was going to be this like darkening of the sun, right? Uh, and then lead this, uh, the biggest slave rebellion in U.S. history, um, which in fairness, like when we hear those, we're like, wow. But it, you know, resulted in the numbers vary between 50 and 60 um, whites being killed. Uh, and it was men, women, children, babies. Like it was really, really like a horrific amounts of violence and resulted in horrific amounts of violence because after Nat Turner's rebellion, then there was like a, you know, Nat Turner encouraged all these slaves to rise up and kill their masters and kill their master's kids because the master's kids were going to be masters someday. But then the response to that was to arrest the people who were involved in the rebellion and also then, like, come down on anybody who was enslaved who might do this again. Right. And so you have this one guy who sees an eclipse, causes this rebellion, and then the response is that, like, the state of Virginia institutes all these new laws, and it kind of messes up racial relations in America for a long time. Pushes them back? It does, right? Like, because uh, you get this community in Virginia that's very afraid of the enslaved population. They're like, that guy, like, got a vision and, like, killed people, so we need to step on those people even more. Mm. And, you know, that's – you have to wonder, like – what, how, how tied to that eclipse was that, right? Like that it was such a strange event and to imagine like living through this too, right? Like you're living through an eclipse and there's a slave rebellion happening at the same time. Um, and just how kind of off kilter everybody would have been in that moment. Mm. So where does that fall relative to, uh, it's obviously pre-Civil War. It is, yeah. Is it just before? So, um, out of curiosity? Yeah, it's fine. Um, Nat Turner's rebellion was 1828, um, and the Civil War is like 1860s, mm -hmm. so it, I mean, it is considered like a generation and, and a precursor, right? That it's like the tensions over slavery are, the are coming of, to a boil. Yeah. And I think we see that all throughout history, right? That um, any place that was already tense and then an eclipse happens, it, it's a triggering event, right? Or it's like, well, then we're going to do this, right? Like somehow the eclipse plays into the actions of people who are already 
like planning a thing and then the eclipse just pushes it to some new level of extreme so it's a thing now in in modern history i mean modern now today obviously that's not happening these days right right people aren't spazzing out yeah um we just aren't so much good stuff connects here yeah and i don't know if you i mean i don't have any other things to ask about. We've covered so many things, mm-hmm. but but I know that there's so much more. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if there's anything in particular that you want to hit on. Like, you know, this all connects to these things. Um, yeah. Um, I think that, you know, it, it eclipses, they come up in history. And so I feel like a lot of times when I'm studying, so like the Nat Turner Rebellion is such an important moment in U.S. history that if you read about Nat Turner, you're going to read about an eclipse. Um, but I didn't feel like I'd really dug into like the history of eclipses before, you know, being invited to the podcast. And I'm like, okay, I'll go back and like, think about, you know, all of human history and where do we see these eclipses happening? And, um, I ran across this, uh, this historian, his guy, a guy named Steve Ruskin, and he wrote a book called America's first great eclipse. Mm. And, uh, he he said in it something that I was just like yes like this to me like is is why we're kind of history and space science like tie together. Um, he said in kind of the intro of his book he said I uh, what I find most amazing having studied eclipses throughout history is that no matter the time period or the scientific knowledge or lack thereof human responses to an eclipse are consistently universally expressions of awe wonder and even fear and terror. Um, I'm like that's so cool right that. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what they believe. It doesn't matter what period of the timeline we're on, right? If we drop ourselves off at random and be like, this civilization, right? Like, we don't know how much scientific knowledge they have or whatever. It doesn't matter. That society responds to a, a total eclipse with awe and wonder. Right, those same things. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's no way we talked uh, – when you talk to others, to scientists who go and chase these things mm-hmm. – uh, they go to them and they see that thing. Yeah. People that have seen it five times before. Yeah. People and their children who've never seen one and they all react the same way. Yeah. It, and I, I don't, and you can't explain that. Yeah. Right. It's truly. It's uh, cool that it's a, um, a universal and uniting thing. Like we have so many divisions in the world um, throughout history and today. Uh, and to be able to say like, this is something that, regardless of our language or beliefs or political affiliation that mm-hmm. we go, wow, right? when we see it, like it, it's, it's kind of stops us in our tracks regardless of who we are. So. This has been fantastic. And I super, I'm elated that, that we've had the chance to sit in with no bells to stop us. From That's talking. right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uninterrupted. So uh, nerding out about the things that we nerd out about. Yeah. So. Uh, this conversation has helped me to appreciate the cultural perspectives that I wouldn't have known to know about. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, it's the same for me too. Like as somebody who studies history, like um, having like, there's so few things that we can say all humans get. Right. Like, you know, like the Romans did this and then like the modern Japanese do this. And it's like, what do those people have in common? And it's like at any point in time in the history timeline, space is what they had in common. Mm. Like, that's cool. That's really cool. So, and it was the same space. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Staring like, at the same stars and the same moon. And, like, that's very cool. Yeah. It's like the romantic side of science. It is. I mean, it's yeah, like, that's well, true. We all get the same stars. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, how we interpret them yeah. changes the way we live our lives. Super cool. Uh, this has been awesome. And I will probably say it 16 more times if I don't stop myself. <laughs> All right. uh, I appreciate your light, lighthearted way to look at the, these heavy things of the past, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, your, your, your take on culture and the fact that you want to be involved with other facets of it all. And we're not just in our little, our little, uh, cubby hole doing our one yeah. little thing yeah. that's pretty awesome Can so this together yeah i appreciate it so thank you so very much yeah. thank you for having me and i would just say in closing stay inspired